sorry, folks. Back on the Boss Man show, in front of the show, Pat Kelsey, Charleston Cougars doing big things. 10 game winning streak going on right now. Pat, what's up, brother? How you doing, man? Boss Man. Yes, yeah, we're How doing you doing, game, brother. <laughs> Loving life. How do you get how do you get that nickname? My dad. No, my dad was the big boss man from the barbershop. Okay. And I became Jay because I'm a junior. Jay Jr. Jay are the boss man. So I was Love a little it. boss man in the barbershop. The little kids. So that's where I played from. That's a big time nickname, man. <laughs> yes. And you know what, Pat? It's funny. My dad is still 82 years old, coaching ball and cutting hair still. Eight Praise years God. Old, Praise God, man. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. That's how I got it. But four years old in the barbershop, brother. Four years old. <laughs> I wish I had, I wish I had more for him to cut. <laughs> Hey, me and you both, I hear like going back far too. <laughs> I know, right? We both going through it, man. We both Happens to the best of us. Yes, indeed. Well, tell me this, Pat, man. Uh, yeah, you're in year two, man. What's been the big difference for you and your program from year one now to year two, doing what you've done so far this year, man? Well, you know, when you get to year two, building your culture, you have a um, locker room full of guys that, that know what to expect, right, um, this summer was much different than the summer prior because we were just building it from the ground floor, right? We were building it from scratch. And to have so many returners that know our terminology, uh, know the core principles of our program, and be able to not only from the coaching staff, but player to player, to be able to, um, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, sell, sell our message every day. And that's been a great luxury. We've got great leadership from the guys that are returning from last year. And then even the pieces that we have added, several of the transfers, a couple of the grad transfers, those guys are all, um, they, 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 they're just about what we're about. And uh, we got a locker room full of leaders. And, uh, and I'm lucky as a coach to have that. No doubt. And, you know, uh, <laughs> a six-game win streak doing a non-con is very amazing. And you've won some close games about the leadership because you know, and you and I both know this is a possession game, man. So it's about possession, making the key play, the keys up at the right time. So that's about the leadership of your guys through this winning streak and having guys who play and understand what you do to get you over the hump in these tight games. Yeah, you know, we we do. We have uh we 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 have a roster full of of guys that are winners and know how to win. And winning's hard. I tell them all the time. There's this this chart, right? It's like a parabola and it's called the mountain of average, you know? And, and if you look down at the bottom of the mountain, if it goes like this on both sides, there's very few of, you know, uh, bad teams, bad organizations, uh, bad businesses, because they don't last very long and they go out of business. And then on the other end, there's very, very few uh, elite organizations and elite teams and elite businesses, because it's really hard to be elite. Right. What goes into that? You know, it starts with obviously the talent, but the belief in the system, the adherence and the excellence to the daily process. That's hard to do. And then where the majority of the world lives, teams, businesses, organizations is in that what we call mountain of average. And it's what we fight every single day, you know, to not be in that mountain of average, to do things different. And um, to this point, our guys have done everything we've asked. And it's a special group. We're one of the deepest teams in the country. Um, you know, we play eight guys starter minutes and, um, you know, it's, it's what we call the power of the unit. It's each guy giving of themselves for the good of the whole. And, uh, I think that's a big reason that makes us special. No doubt. And like you said, Pat, depth is very important because not going to worry on to happen. In injuries happen. And we both know that. So like having a deep roster of guys who you can trust in any given time to come in the game and play. It's a luxury to have as a coach, and like you said, me being, being, being a football player, you know, I know about having been, been a team guy to myself. Sometimes I wanted the ball, Pat. We had a running play. I didn't want to do it, but I had the block. So giving yourself up for the better of a team is something that's so important. And I'm glad you guys are see that already, having a deep roster, guys who know they can play more minutes, but because it's better for the team, I set my offense role or my role as a screener. So it's great that you have it on your team already, brother. Yeah, I'm lucky in that regard, and that's uh, the makeup of our guys, the competitive character that they have and the buy-in to uh, to what we're all about. And, and I'm very blessed and lucky to have the roster that we have, and it's 
the biggest reason that we've had such a successful season to this point. And Pat, the CAA man has been, man, you all doing great this work non-con year, man. So about when you get into chill conference play coming up on the 29th of December after you play Coastal Carolina here on 19, but that, your league is very, very deep and adding Hampton and A&T now as well to the mix, man. Talk about this, what you all got going to say, and Mama too, from top to top, bottom, brother, your, your league. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, to be honest with you, boss man, I'm not, uh, I don't have the bandwidth and the wherewithal and the intelligence and the smarts to be able to look too far out in the future. Uh, because what happens is, you know, I trip over what's right in front of me and uh, yes. we're pretty good at keeping blinders on and just focusing on the next thing. We're very well aware that conference play is coming. I'm very well aware of what you mentioned, you know, the caliber of teams and coaches uh, I'm very well aware that throughout the months of January and February and then into early March, there's going to be knockdown, drag outs, battles like there is every year in the CAA. You know, but our sole focus is on the next thing. And that's, you know, right now getting ready for Coastal Carolina. Um, after that game, obviously, our guys will have a little bit of a break. And then we'll come back and we'll jump right into conference play. Uh, but right now, our sole focus is on the next deal. No doubt about Coastal Carolina, uh, <clears throat> Pat. Um... Cliff Ellis, man, 900 wins, a uh, legend in our game. We both love but like Cliff Ellis, what he's meant to the game of basketball. And we're simply with his team on film, film right now, brother. Yeah, you know, I have the utmost respect for Coach Ellis. I've known him for a long time. Uh, I was the head coach at Winthrop for many years, and we were in the same conference as Coastal Carolina and on campus in Rock Hill at Winthrop and on campus at Coastal Carolina, the Winthrop and um, Coastal Carolina rivalry was, you know, one of the most heated that I'd been a part of. And obviously they left the league my last several years at Winthrop, but we've had many, many battles. Uh, played in the, in the conference championship game on national television two years in a row against Coach Ellis and, and Coastal. Uh, and and, and I, the one thing I'd say amongst other things about Coach Ellis, yes, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. Uh, a legend in our business, 900 games. Like, are you kidding me? Winning 900 games, that's elite. But the other thing is uh, he, he was very good to me when I first came into the league as a young coach that didn't know up from down, didn't know what the heck I was doing. And in those league meetings, he would kind of, you know, give me some advice and give me some guidance. Um, I remember one time we had our league meetings down in Hilton Head and he was like playing the guitar down by the, by the ocean. Like he's a Renaissance man. Like, you know, he can, he'd sing and play the guitar. He would coach hoop. Um, he's just a really, really interesting guy with a big heart. He's always been really good to me. Looking forward to competing against him this week. No doubt, man. And you know what it said? Cliff Ellis, I said, I remember Auburn days. I was a kid. I, I remember I had a ball boy for him. This is his in Atlanta. That's, is that right? That's, 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 how, that's how I remember Ellis, man. Being a ball boy, see some of that at the Georgia, Georgia, Georgia Dome back in the day. <laughs> and it's, it's wild, Pat. <clears throat> Tony Delk is a scout for the Mavericks now, right? And I told, I told him, I said, Tony, that game you played Arkansas, I was your ball boy as an eight year old kid, man. When you play Arkansas, in that game in the Dome, he's like, making me feel old, JR. I said, Tony, I'm going to tell you the truth, man. I was eight years old, ball boy for you, Georgia Dome, <laughs> but you played Arkansas, man. I know it's just amazing those moments that you remember uh, doing those type of things like, you know, on a totally different level. I mean, you were at big time college level ball boying for Tony Delk and those guys. Uh, but I remember one of my greatest memories from childhood is my uncle was the coach at one of the big high schools in the state of Ohio. And they were playing in the state championship in Columbus at old St. John's Arena, home of the Ohio State Buckeyes. And my cousin and I were on the floor as a ball boy for that game, one of my fondest, greatest memories, and I'm sure that's the same thing for you. No doubt, Pat. You know what I'm going to tell you, man? We're, I, we're <laughs> blessed, and I'm blessed, man. Like I told, told you before, man, I grew up five minutes from the Georgia Dome as a kid, right? So being able to cover the Falcons, the Hawks, the Braves, knowing that as a kid, I couldn't afford to go to these places, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then I'm credentialed to be there every time I want to. So it's like, Knowing that is how blessed the Lord has done for me, man. As from a going from a kid to where I am now, it's just me living the dream. Like I talk about Brooklyn every day, which is amazing, you know. That's awesome. And, and the reason you're having such success is um it to me, it, you know, it's so obvious, it's just 
the passion that you have for what you do. Uh, I'm such a big believer in that, 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 you know, when you have passion, you work hard, you, you, you pour yourself into whatever endeavor you're involved with, you're going to have success in that. And I've always appreciated that about you. When you've had me on the show, you can just sense it, even though we're on a computer screen on a zoom, we're not face to face. I can just feel, you know, the energy with which you do what you do. And I appreciate that a lot. No doubt, Pat. I'm going to tell you, man, uh, I enjoy being in Cincinnati in summer. I went to the Western Cincinnati Open. I saw Rafael Nadal play. He lost. But seeing the Nadal play, if it makes was fun, man, going to Kings Island, man, I enjoyed that trip of the Cincinnati summer. Me and my buddies, Big Ten's fans. So, man, I enjoyed your hometown, man. It was great to be up there and watch the tournament. You ever go to that tournament whenever you're in town? Go up, up, up to Mason? Yeah, you know, that's a – world-class tournament you know besides the majors my understanding is that's one of the biggest one of the biggest tennis tournaments in america it's one of the master series uh and it's kind of ironic um you know it's been the western southern open for years and years um and just recently uh, a, a gentleman in his group from here in charleston that also owns the tennis tournament here in charleston and the tennis stadium here on daniel island um just recently purchased the uh that that tournament in Ohio so kind of have a cool connection with that but haven't been in years just because I've been out of out of town when I come in town it's just about seeing my family and my wife's family and seeing the nieces and nephews and I, I if I can sneak in a Bengals game or Reds game I do that but haven't been in during those times when the tennis tournament's going on but it's a big time deal there's no doubt well I was there for the Falcon game this this when they Bengals kicked our butts <laughs> Gave us a good butt whooping up there. I, I enjoy being at Park Royal Stadium, but but being on the field, man, and Burrow and those guys you got, Pat, man, Chase, Higgins, man, Boyd, man. Well, he, here here's a little secret that I think the whole world knows about sports and winning, uh, in 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 building championships. Uh, my mom says this all the time. She didn't make up the quote. Some smart coach did. But she uses all the time. She reminds me of it. It's not about the X's and O's. It's about the Jimmy's and the Joe's. Uh, I'm not a very good coach at all if I don't have good players. And, um, you know, I have such respect for the culture that Zach Taylor and his staff has built in Cincinnati. You can feel it. You know, the players are leaning forward. There's a bounce in their step. Uh, there's a belief. There's a way. Uh, and, and I have a ton of respect for that. Um, but, but make no mistake. Joe Burrow's the real deal. Yes. He's the real deal. And in that sport, if you have an elite quarterback, you know, and it's early in his career, and it's it's almost like blasphemy to say this or for anybody to say this, but I've heard it said recently, he's the closest thing to Joe Montana that this league has seen since Joe Montana. And I watch every single Bengals game, and – uh, obviously, everybody knows about his confidence and his swagger, but just his uh, Kobe Bryant-like mentality of, you know, just just uh, of winning, right, and of of blocking out noise and, and stepping up in big moments and making big plays. He's got it. And obviously, he's got amazing, amazing talent around him like Jamar Chase and and T Higgins and Tyler Boyd and the defense has really, really come along and we're, we're a championship contender. And I think we're a Super Bowl contender, but there ain't, there, make no mistake. Joe Burrow is the dude boss, man. He's that Amen. good. Amen. Amen. Seen him twice this year in person, once in steady <laughs> one in Tennessee as well. The Titans. I mean, you had no Jamar Chase out there. It was just T Higgins and him for the most part. I think that's the game that Mixon got hurt too. <laughs> And still, yeah, look at his eye, man. Got the job to a tough, tight team at home. Defense can't give you trouble with their pass rush. Joe stood cool in the pocket and just did his thing. And also, the line's gotten better, too. Zach Taylor's in the hood, job at the line. Samarji Piran back in Evans as well. The Beatles have weapons in every position, and I love it. And I, I think I mean, it's so much fun to see, too, and it's kind of like, as a coach, you, you value this so much and appreciate it. When all those guys went down, Chase is down, you know, hit, and other guys step up. You know, uh, Joe Mixon goes down, a running back. Samaji Pirine steps up and played at a championship level. That next man up mentality. And I hate to give the Pittsburgh Steelers props because nobody uh, dislikes the Steelers more than I do because it's our bitter rival. 
but you got to tip your cap to their culture over the years. And they're not great right now, but decades of seeing them, you know, have that culture and that next man up mentality and that toughness and that winning way. Um, and to see the Bengals have that now is a, 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 a like I said, you know, a credit and a tip of the cap to what the coaching staff has built as well. No doubt, Pat. I'll be cheering for you guys, man. I, I like the Bengals. I think I, I'm, I'm sick of the Chiefs and the Bills personally. So I, I want to see them go back, man, because I'm back in the day. I used to like Garnet Scott, Carl Pickens, and Asias and Jeff Blake and all those dudes. I used to cheer for them, play with them on my, my old it Madden game back in the day. NFL action when I was a kid, man. So I, I love the jerseys back in the day, man. So, yeah, I, I'll cheer for you guys. I, I want somebody different finally. I man. mean, if if a Cincinnati person heard this and heard you, like, mention those names, you would get major, major, major props, major street cred that no, you know your Cincinnati stuff. You're like, you're, you're throwing out Darnay Scott. You're throwing out Shaken Blake, Jeff Blake. You're throwing out Carl Pickens. Uh, uh, I was at Corey Dillon's game when he broke the all-time single-game rushing record. My brother and I never forget it. You remember that? Yes, I do. Yep. I remember going to Riverfront Stadium. I remember going there with my with my father. I, I, I've, been, I've been to the old stadium. I've been there. Well, you so. mentioned not being able to get into the, um, you know, to the to the Georgia Dome. Uh, luckily, I got in good and got to know one of the ushers, and he he took a liking to me. So we, we we would go up with some buddies and just kind of walk around the concourse until we made eye, eye contact with him. And he'd kind of go like this, and he'd let us into a bunch of games. So I think the statute of limitations has passed where I or he can't get in trouble for that. But we got into a lot of games at Riverfront Stadium without a ticket, I can tell you that. Let me tell you a quick story about that with the old Omni Arena with the, the Hawks. We, we knew how to get in there because there's some holes we can sneak in. On the, we know how to get into old, old Omni. We know, it closed in 97. We know how to sneak, sneak in that joint, too, man. So it was like, yeah, man, those were the days, man. I remember going to Riverfront Stadium when they actually when they actually put you all in Paul Brown. But it was, it was building very much a ballpark, right, which was a Reds game when it was still kind of there and it was kind of half gone. So I remember seeing that look of the Reds game, too, because I was a big yeah. Reds fan, of course. So we used to watch on the sports channel with, with, with Marty with, with Marty Brennerman and somebody else. You know who it was, his partner. That's funny, man. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, know, I, you know I, I your stuff. Cincinnati sports boy. I, I know I mean, about You know, you mentioned man. the Marty Brennermans. I, that's Cincinnati royalty right there, man. Hey, man, I know about your town, brother. I, I, I grew up watching. We, got, we, I, we just got to get our Reds going. You know, it's the sad state of Major League, you know, baseball and the economics that are involved with it. It's just really hard for, uh, uh, you know, small market teams to compete. And it's sad, you know, and I, I don't know what the answer is there. I know I have my personal beliefs and it will never change because, you know, the, the, the big market teams and the Yankees that have hundreds and hundreds, even billion dollar TV deals. Uh, and then their payroll can be what it is versus a small market team, you know, and you see like the way the NFL has grown and evolved into the number one sport in our country and it's not even close but you know and I'm a big believer that a big reason for that is whether you're in Buffalo you're in Kansas City you're in Cincinnati or you're in LA or in New York you know everybody has an equal chance to be competitive <clears throat> and I think that has built an excitement and a fervor and a passion for that sport um, you know and back in the 80s when I was growing up it was still that way in baseball where where it didn't matter who you were you had a chance to have a championship team and i think you know households and kids and they grew up in the board that that helped grow the passion and continued the passion of baseball and i think the apathy that's kind of been built up um and you see these other sports that have leapfrogged the nba and and the nfl um, and I think it's because there's not that passion for baseball at a young age. And part of that is, is like, I'm trying to get Johnny passionate about baseball. My son, Johnny, I'm trying to get him passionate about the Reds. And he's into it and he watches the games, but like, he's not into it like he's into the Bengals because he knows the Bengals have a chance to win a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. We watch the Reds and they're 40 games below 500. It's like, Dad, what are we doing? No, nah, you got to understand it's the sound of the game and it's the, it's it's the the rhythm of baseball and it's the reds and it's in our dna and it's in our blood and he's like ah, you know whatever hey, let, let's go out and shoot some hoops so 
You know what? I'm okay with that too, boss man. Those crazy that Patty is my father had me as a young dude, man. Listen to the radio, listen to the radio. We had, we watched the game on TV. I had the radio on the same time. We listened to both at the same time. He had me out hitting. He showed me how to switch hit too, brother. I he, <laughs> he left it in there. My father, he was to be chief said, son, pick he said, said me, pick a struggle, son, whether it be football, basketball, baseball. I want you to do something sports wise. Well, I told football and I was fast as a receiver, but he showed me all these sports and wanted me to know about them. And he, because my dad loves sports, he still does. He's still yeah. a coach. He's still coaches. So if my father has some sports, eight two years old. It's crazy in his barber shop. He's like, nah, you, I know about all these things, you, 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 you young man. I, I said, oh, Mister Mister J, you old. My my, my dad hates that. <laughs> that eight two years old. I know more than you ever know about sports in your whole life, son. <laughs> I argue with my pops about sports. He'll get on you to this day, man. So cool to hear stories about your dad, and and um, you know he should, he should write a book. You talk about a slice of Americana, right? Like just the the institution that the the barber shop is, and the stories that he could tell, um, and just the wisdom that guys like that have, just because the, the, it's the hub of 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 conversation in 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 America. So. What a cool thing. And um, I love to hear you speak of reverence of your father. You can tell when you talk about him, how close you guys are, how much you love him. And uh, I feel the same way about my dad, man. That's really cool. And Pat, his barbers are eight. He's 82. Mr. Mr. Ray is 77. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Ed is 73. We got two young dudes. So three, three, three OGs and two young young dudes in the barbershop with him with his five chairs, man. And my dad made some good money with his booth rent too. He said, I, That's so awesome. I, don't, I don't have to. I make money off state booth rents. So my great my great grandfather, might have been my great great grandfather, but I think it was my great grandfather was a barber, and his barber shop was um just less than a mile, maybe a quarter of a mile from old Crosley Field, which was the Red Stadium before they built Riverfront Stadium. So my grandma would tell me about how, you know, teams would come into town and he would cut the hair of, you know, the, these these famous baseball players and, and things like that. And somehow I got that talent. Like I started cutting hair um, when I was probably in grade school, seventh and eighth grade. And then I became the guy throughout high school that cut all of my guy's hair. Um, as you can tell, I'm not very talented because I cut my own hair. I cut my son's hair. Uh, I'm a big Clippers guy. I'm not a big Scissors guy. So tell, tell your tell your dad, uh, big tip of the cap, because I, I got a lot of respect for guys that 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 have talent up top. You know, you got that right in Pat was about my dad. He knows every one of my guests. He he looks up you all himself. <laughs> uh, is that right? <laughs> yes. Yes, he plays me in the shot. This is my son talking to this coach. Look, look at my son. I know about this guy. I got to see what this guy's done. That's so, awesome. So Will you tell him I said hello? Uh, he'll hear this. Yes, he'll see that here. I was definitely yes, the big boss man, JC. You know, that guy's that guy's a great guy, Pat. Hope y'all come to Atlanta and y'all play here one time. I think you can meet this guy. You would enjoy talking to my father for an hour in his shop. He can buzz you up every day for for before the game starts. Love it. I love it. I'll do that, man. Let's do it. No doubt with Pat, man. Let's really talk to you, my brother. Glad you're living in one, man, doing big things over in Charleston. Glad you got the job, man. So we'll do this again real soon. I'll text you off there about what we talked about before, before the interview started. So I hope that happens for you, brother. You talk, talk to your legends of your Bengals, man. Yeah, man. You told me off air that, that you know Solomon Wilcox and, and Adam Pac-Man Jones. Those are two other Bengal legends. So <laughs> yeah, you can introduce yeah. me to them, man. Like, jeez. I owe you. Yes, indeed. Well, I made that out of for you, my brother. Hey, Pat, man. Merry Christmas, man. Hope you and the wife and the kids have a great time this holiday season. Enjoy some time off as well, brother. I know you work we're grinding like crazy, bro. Enjoy some time off, man. It's your family, brother. All right, boss, man. Good seeing you, buddy. Thank you. See you, Pat. See you, brother. Take care, man. See you, man. All right.